get started. The six steps of GIS problem solving or how you do GIS. The very first step in GIS problem solving is to develop a very crisp, clear, and actionable question to answer or problem to solve. I love these three words, crisp, clear, actionable. Without that, you're going to have an extremely difficult time and probably not going to be able to at all complete a GIS project. I do want you to notice here that I'm being a little bit more broad than saying develop a hypothesis. Uh, if clearly if you have a very solid, very crisp hypothesis and you're trying to do some kind of scientific research study, then you do have something that's crisp, clear, and actionable. So this would encompass that kind of project, but uh, I'm being intentionally a bit more broad here. There are lots of uh, questions that need to be answered that have a geographic or geospatial component. There are lots of problems that have to be solved uh, that have uh, a geospatial component to it that are particularly apt for having uh, GIS methodology applied to them. So if you have any kind of uh, question to answer or problem to solve with that kind of component, uh, then these six steps are still going to be the ones that you need to move through. I can't overemphasize really how important it is to develop this crisp, clear, and actionable question to answer or problem to solve. If you don't have that, then you're not on step one. You are still on step zero which is topic. And it's very, very important to make sure that we can distinguish between having a topic and having a step one crisp, clear, and actionable question to answer or problem to solve. Because one of the most fundamental mistakes that I see students make in geographic information systems when they're trying to go out and create their own project is that they think they are done with step one. They think they have this uh, really crisp and clear, actionable question to answer or problem to solve and that they're ready to go. But in reality, they actually often and just have a topic and often they have an undeveloped topic so we want to start off by talking about the distinction between being step zero and step one step zero your topic is extremely important you have to start with a topic but when you really start moving forward with your project it's when you develop a step one crisp clear actionable question to answer or problem to solve topics are things that you might say to somebody in the most briefest circumstance when you're talking to them about what you do. If you're meeting somebody in the hallway, you know, uh, people talk about your elevator pitch. Uh, it might, a topic is probably even shorter than an elevator pitch. Uh, the topic may be one word. If it's somewhat undeveloped, it may be three or four or maybe five words once you start to develop it more. So let's take a look at the difference between topic and crisp, clear, actionable question or problem. Let me give you some examples of undeveloped topics. And if there was a step negative one, we might say that if you have an undeveloped topic, then you're still before step zero. You hear all the time somebody getting some advice uh, that you, they need to develop their topic more, or uh, that, well, they're having problems because their topic isn't developed. What does that mean? Here are some examples of undeveloped topics. GIS remote sensing, geostatistics, electoral geography, biogeography, pine trees, war, porcupines, Germany, sub-Saharan Africa, geopolitics, quantitative methods, Croatia, snails, disease, coral reefs, agent-based modeling, computer simulations, climate change, or the Himalayas. These all sound like really interesting things to study. And it is certainly the case uh, that all of these are topics that can be studied. And they're the kinds of things that you hear someone say uh, in the most briefest sorts of ways. Oh, what do you study? What do you do? Oh, I'm interested in biogeography. Oh, I'm studying Germany. Oh, I'm a geostatistician. Or that sort of a statement that someone will make. And these are topics, they're somewhat undeveloped, but unfortunately I see a lot that someone will try to start a GIS project and they'll say, well, I'm trying to study climate change. I'm trying to study the Himalayas. Okay, they're not on step one. This is still uh, working with their topic. There are some fantastic studies that can be done on all of these things. There are many fantastic studies that could be done on any of these things up here on the screen. And I just put these up here as some basic examples. But we've got to go much further in developing this before we can begin our GIS project. Well, what really does having a developed topic mean? What does it mean to have a good topic? Well, I would say that a fully developed topic 
follows the geographic triad, and I think this is pretty important. If you've taken classes from me before, and you've heard my What is Geography lecture, then you've heard me talk about the geographic triad in some detail. I'm not going to go over it in that level of detail here, but I want to briefly uh, summarize it so that you know how it relates to topic development. The geographic triad is methodology, location, and theme. Most not all, but most projects in geography have these three components. So if you're trying to develop a topic, you put all three of these together. I'm going to put a little asterisk by methodology because it's a little bit different from location and theme when you're trying to put together a geographic project, but I'll explain a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. So, methodologies. These are things like GIS, remote sensing, statistical analysis, quantitative methods, locations, I hope that's obvious, southeastern United States, France, the world, northeast Washington, D.C. Themes are things that you can study. Political geography, economic geography, biological geography, human environment interactions. And most geographic projects are going to have all three of these involved in the project. Oh, by the way, I would also say that if you want to add a temporal component to location, that's perfectly okay. That's very important. There's no reason to just limit ourselves to just spatial location. We can talk about spatio-temporal location. Because it might certainly be the case that you're interested in studying the biological geography of the world, but not today, 50 years ago political geography a hundred years ago, you can certainly add uh, time to geography. I mean, that's absolutely essential in many cases. So you can think about these things as far as spatio-temporal goes and not just spatial. So you might choose to do a remote sensing analysis of the world's biological geography. The world is a big place. We study location at different scales, but you can certainly study the entire world in geography. A GIS analysis of the political geography of the southeastern United States. A quantitative method study of human environmental interactions in northeastern Washington, D.C. Now I realize that most people taking this particular course are interested in the methodology of GIS. So probably many people who are doing this, this is GIS problem solving, already know the methodology that they want to use or are interested in knowing some more about is GIS. Either because uh, you are just interested in using computers to solve geographic problems in general and want to know more about that particular uh, methodology and specialize in that methodology, or because uh, a person already has a theme and a location and some kind of really crisp and clear question and they realize that using computers to solve it would be a, an excellent way to go about answering that question or solving that problem, and so they already know that this is a methodology that they're going to need. So I realize that most people here and our focus from here on out is using a particular methodology. So we'd talk about a, a GIS uh, study of northeastern Washington DC's human environment interactions. We'd talk about a GIS study of the biological geography of France or a GIS analysis of the economic geography of uh, someplace in DC or something like that. So if we go back and look at these undeveloped topics that we were looking at before, you will see that they fit into one of those three categories. Either the uh, methodology, the location, or the theme. These are themes you can study. Different levels of granularity. Uh, Biogeography is a big topic. Porcupines is a more narrower topic, for instance. But these are clearly themes outlined here in red. These are methods outlined here in blue. And those that are left over, those again should be pretty obvious that they're locations. So it's really the case that many times when people get involved in geography and they want to do some kind of geographic project, they will choose one of those three elements of the geographic triad. They'll be very interested in studying a particular location. They'll be very interested in studying a particular theme like war, geopolitics, economic geography, something like that. Or they may be very interested in developing uh, proficiency, a specialization in some kind of methodology, whether it's geostatistics, uh, GIS, remote sensing, uh, one of the many different methodologies that we have in geography for solving problems. So if you just have one of those components of the geographic triad, you have an undeveloped topic very important, that's where everyone starts, but then you start to take that undeveloped topic, that one part of the triad, and start to marry it with uh, the other two elements of the triad that you're also interested in. And then you have uh, a developed topic once you have all three of those components.
I do want to talk a little bit more about turning a topic. Once you have a fully developed topic, how do you turn that topic into an actionable problem or question? One of those crisp and clear problems or questions in order to go and do GIS with. Let me give you an example that I had from one of my students. It's an excellent example. He wanted to do a GIS project and he said, I want to do a project on the future of coral reefs. He was very interested in coral reefs. He knew a lot about them. Uh, he was studying GIS methodology. And so he came up with this general idea, I would like to do a study about the future of coral reefs. What's the problem with that? Well, I mean, on one level, nothing. Fantastic, we can do all kinds of different studies on coral reefs. But what's essential to uh, understand here is that that is a topic. That is not some kind of actionable problem or question that we can actually sit down and do GIS with. No one can. No one can sit down in front of their computer and have some GIS software up and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to sit down this afternoon and I'm going to come up with a fantastic GIS project that will tell me what the future of coral reefs is. It's just not possible. It cannot happen. So what's important to realize is this is a topic. And in order to get to step one, we've got to narrow this down to a very actionable question or problem uh, that will allow us to go and do some GIS. He did an excellent job of this. He went from having just this topic, the future of coral reefs, to this very specific question. Which abandoned oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico are ideally located for the development of artificial reefs? Do you see the difference here? I hope you do. This is a topic, step zero. This is a question, step one. If you just have the future of coral reefs, fantastic, great topic but know where you are. You're not ready to move on to like step two, for instance. You've got to get to step one and come up with this very crisp and clear question. The future of coral reefs. As far as the topic uh, goes, I would describe that as vague. It's non-specific. It's very big. If you've got words like that that describe what you're trying to do, it may be a, a big hint to you that you may have a topic and you don't have uh, a step one crisp, clear question or problem. On the other hand, I would use crisp, clear, actionable, tight to describe this question about uh, the abandoned oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. And then this went on to be an absolutely incredible project. But you can see that it's very, very broad to say, what's the future of coral reefs? It might not look like the future of coral reefs sitting right there is a completely developed topic with the geographic triad, but the future of coral reefs, that's definitely a theme. That's something to be studied. It was a GIS class, so the methodology was going to be geographic information systems. And then that being so broad, uh, you know, you're talking about coral reefs over the entire world. I mean, you could, right? What's the future of coral reefs where? Maybe all over the world. Very big, very broad. Not something anyone can do. You can tell that there would be hundreds, if not thousands, of different questions of different problems that would need to be answered in order to be able to address a topic as broad as the future of coral reefs. But then going down here to which abandoned oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico are ideally located for the development of artificial reefs, that is uh, crisp, clear, and we're ready to go. I want to point out that this is not exactly a distinction between easy and hard. Once you get to the end of step one and you have this crisp, clear, and actionable question or problem, some of them will be easy to answer, some of them will be harder to answer, some of them will be very hard to answer. So it's not really the case that, oh, it will be easy once you develop a crisp, clear, and actionable question or problem. My point is that it will at least be possible at that point. If you've got this very vague and general idea, you're still on topic, it's not really that it's hard to do a GIS project on that. It may well be that it is impossible to do a GIS project on that. The future of coral reefs, it's impossible to sit down and do a GIS project on that. Then you develop a whole bunch of crisp and clear questions that might go into addressing that topic. Some of the questions that you develop out of that topic will be easy, some of them that may be much harder. So it's not exactly easy and hard. It's a little bit different, uh, the point that I'm trying to make here. Let me just give you a, a few final examples. Topic, a GIS study of climate change in the Philippines. Problem or question, what percentage of the urban population in the Philippines will be at a high risk for storm surge flooding in 2035 if sea level rises at its current anticipated rate? See the difference? Topic, a remote sensing study of glacial retreat in the Arctic. How much polar bear habitat has been lost in the last 20 years as the result of Arctic glacial retreat? 
a geostatistical analysis of the spread of disease in Africa. What areas are predicted to be hot spots for African sleeping sickness next year? A quantitative method study of the effect of deforestation in the Gambia. How do the Gambian people perceive the effects of deforestation on their well-being? These are the differences between topic and problem or question. And really, I can't tell you how important that is. That's the first thing you have to do. Realize whether you've got a topic or whether you're into step one. Because if you think that you're done with step one, but you still have just a topic, you've got a very vague idea of what you're doing, it's going to be impossible to conduct your GIS study. And I see this all the time in students who are trying to uh, do GIS work. So make certain that you understand the difference between those two and make sure that you have a very crisp, clear, and actionable question to answer or problem to solve before moving on. That's the first order of business. I'll see you in the next lesson.